tonight, parting ways. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his wife Sophie are separating after 18 years of marriage. The high profile split. His father went through a separation, so he understands the impact. And the path forward. Like lots of families, they're gonna have to figure out how to make it work. That is unreal. New damage as raging wildfires race across BC. Just an absolute tornado of fire. The drought fueling the destruction. Plaza deep dive on a remarkable discovery. It's a very nice feeling to know that we've uncovered something like that. A series of shipwrecks off the Canadian coast. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. The Prime Minister and Sophie Gregoire Trudeau made a very personal revelation today under a glaring public spotlight. They are facing something that many Canadians have had to deal with in their own lives, the breakdown of a marriage. Each released nearly identical posts on social media saying, after many meaningful and difficult conversations, we have made the decision to separate. The couple has been married for 18 years, with eight spent leading the country. Our coverage begins with CTV's Kevin Gallagher. Sophie Gregoire Trudeau and the Prime Minister were once seen as a political power couple. Now they'll no longer represent Canada as a couple. After they signed a legal separation agreement, according to the Prime Minister's office, they're focused on raising their kids in a safe, loving and collaborative environment. Sophie has been a very effective uh, political asset. Um, you know, she's um, been a good, strong campaigner with the Prime Minister. The couple has three children, ages 15, 14 and 9. And according to a source close to the situation, Gregoire Trudeau will still be seen regularly at Rideau Cottage, though she will move to a private residence at her own expense. Sophie, what are you wearing tonight? We all want to know. Oh my God, thank you so much for asking. Their playful personalities captured the attention of international media, with the New York Times comparing them to the Kennedys, dubbing them Canada's Camelot, an image they embraced posing for Vogue magazine. Their fashion-forward style landed them praise and criticism. From Indian media, when they wore traditional clothes on a visit there. Sophie Grégoire was already a well-known television host in Quebec before dating Trudeau. The couple married in Montreal three years before Justin's jump into politics. She was by his side when he became prime minister and spoke of their close connection during an interview with CTV News. My husband and I share such identical core values as human beings that they are kind of like the under speech, I would say, of everything that we talk about. On the couple's anniversary last year, Gregoire Trudeau posted about navigating sunny days and heavy storms in their marriage, acknowledging long-term relationships are challenging. The announcement ended months of speculation about the marriage. Justin Trudeau has already experienced a breakup in the country's highest office when his parents separated in 1977. Pierre Elliott Trudeau still continued his political career then, as his son is promising to do now. You're going to look at how Justin Trudeau is performing and wondering, is he okay? Is he worried about something? Is he focused on his kids? Is he focused on his family? And there'll be a bigger spotlight in terms of how he's coping and managing with this change. The freshly separated couple will still take a family vacation next week as they ask for privacy during this difficult time, Sandy. All right, Kevin, thank you. The Trudeau's international profile meant word of the separation traveled fast around the world. Tonight, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his wife Sophie announcing they have agreed to separate. The news made headlines from the U.S. to the U.K. and France, along with India and China. With more on the impact in this country, here is CTV's chief political correspondent, Vashi Capellos. Well, look, this is very stunning news in the world of Canadian politics. It's just not the kind of news, though, or, or shock or surprise that we're used to getting in Canadian politics. In fact, it's, 
incredibly personal in nature. That's not something we're used to when it comes to politicians generally in this country, but even specifically when it comes to the prime minister. And so it's very early to know if there are any political implications to what's happening right now. We know it's sad uh, from a personal perspective, from a human perspective, but professionally, politically, it's just really early to know what this will mean. I think when it comes to though, questions, political questions I have on the heels of this news. They are very much focused on the prime minister's insistence over the last number of months that he plans to lead the liberals, the federal liberals, into the next election against Pierre Polyev and the conservatives. He said it on a number of occasions. He seems determined to do so. But I think it's also fair to ask, like, if any of our personal circumstances changed, that could necessitate a change in our professional approach as well, or our professional endeavors as well. And also given the role that Sophie Gregoire Trudeau has played, not just in campaigns, but in a litany of political events during the prime minister's time at the helm of this country. I can think of a multitude of political conferences, for example, that I've covered in which she gave a speech to the audience. She's very involved with the liberals, even aside from uh, from the prime minister. So whether that impacts his decision to run in the next election, I think that's where, if, if I were to say there are potential political implications, or at least there are political questions right now, that's where I've got my eyes focused. CTV's Vashi Capellas. Well, there's a lot more about this story on our website. Go to ctvnews.ca for additional coverage of the announcement and the potential political impact. So on the eve of Donald Trump's court appearance in Washington, security is on high alert. The former U.S. president will make history when he is arraigned on alleged attempts to overturn the 2020 election. It is the third time he's been criminally charged. CTV's Heather Wright is in the U.S. Capitol tonight. Donald Trump is accused of trying to subvert democracy, and tomorrow he will be formally arraigned on charges related to his attempts to overturn the 2020 election, the which resulted in the January 6th insurrection, when hundreds of rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol. Since the attack on our Capitol, the Department of Justice has remained committed to ensuring accountability for those criminally responsible for what happened that day. This case is brought consistent with that commitment. The former president is charged with conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, Congress certifying the election results, and conspiracy against the right to vote and have that vote counted. In the indictment, special counsel Jack Smith claims Trump knew his claims about election fraud were false, but he kept repeating them while actively trying to discount votes in an attempt to cling to power. Trump's defense appears to be free speech. This is the first time that the First Amendment has been criminalized. It's the first time that a sitting president is attacking a political opponent on First Amendment grounds and basically making a criminal to, to, to state your position. A key figure in this indictment, former vice president and current GOP rival Mike Pence, who according to the filing was berated by Trump for being too honest to go along with the former president's request that he not certify the election results. I really do believe that uh, Anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. Trump denies any wrongdoing using his latest legal trouble in a new fundraising push online. The indictment also lists six co-conspirators, though doesn't name or charge them. Trump is expected here at federal court tomorrow afternoon and now faces the possibility of at least three separate trials in the next year. Sandy. CTV's Heather Wright in Washington tonight. The man who killed 11 worshippers in the worst anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history has been given the death sentence. There was little reaction from Robert Bowers as jurors in Pittsburgh announced their decision. In June, the 50-year-old was found guilty on 63 charges, including hate crimes. The victims were shot during morning services at the Tree of Life Synagogue five years ago. The evidence in this trial proved that the defendant acted because of white supremacist, anti-Semitic, and bigoted views. I feel like a weight has been lifted and I can breathe a sigh of relief. Six people were wounded in the attack, including four police officers who responded to the shootings. President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling a Russian drone strike on Ukraine today, an attack on the global food supply. A fisherman captured these images of explosions and fires at facilities used to store grain exports on the Danube River near Romania.
The death toll from a flooding disaster in and around Beijing has climbed to at least 21. More than two dozen are still missing as the area copes with the remnants of a typhoon. Some 740 millimeters or 29 inches of rain has fallen since Saturday. That's the most the city has received in at least 140 years. And police in Nova Scotia believe that they have recovered the body of a 14-year-old girl swept away by rushing floodwaters. As CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Ashkute reports, the discovery brings some closure to a community in mourning. After 11 days of searching through grueling heat and long grass, police think they located the remains of the fourth and final person who went missing during Nova Scotia's historic flash flooding. We're working with the Nova Scotia Medical Examiner Service to positively identify the remains, but at this time we believe they are those of the youth who was reported missing on July 22nd. The body was found by a person who was out walking their dog along the shore of Advocate Harbour. The location is 75 kilometers northwest of the area of where the teenager went missing, a hundred kilometers away if you include the intricate waterways. Definitely there is somebody looking upon us yesterday and this morning because they, they brought our Terry Lynn home. The West Hans mayor has identified the victim as 14-year-old Terry Lynn Ketty. The smile, the energy, the life, um, she's going to be missed. Last week, the remains of the other missing six-year-old Colton Sisko, six-year-old Natalie Harnish, and 52-year-old Nicholas Holland were located. RCMP say Holland was in the same vehicle as Ketty attempting to flee the floods. The province's premier thanked first responders today. We found these four souls because of your efforts and we're grateful and thankful uh, for your efforts and, and we'll never know how many, how many lives you saved. The Premier vowed to do more in improving cell reception in rural Nova Scotia again today, as many did not receive the emergency alert during the night of the mass flooding. I'm not happy and we'll be having that discussion. The West Hans Mayor says now that all four are back with their families, the healing process can begin, as so many communities here continue to clean up and rebuild. Sandy. All right, Creason. As Nova Scotia picks up the pieces from historic flooding, B.C. is struggling with severe drought. More than half the province is facing extreme drought conditions while also dealing with challenging wildfires. Here's CTV's Melanie Nagy. Persistent drought has left B.C.'s forests severely parched. We are experiencing the impacts of climate change right now. 23 of our province's 34 water basins are in a drought level 4 or drought level 5. That classification is considered severe and with the hot dry conditions the province continues to be ravaged by hundreds of wildfires. One volatile fire burning north of Whistler recently reached a remote vacation community. Today officials confirmed several structures have been destroyed. Less than five confirmed uh, structural losses. However, we are hearing uh, that there are more. With the wildfire so close, more than 200 properties are under evacuation order. It turned into an inferno. Jeff Lewis was at his cabin yesterday when the fire flared up. He took these photos before fleeing. The wind picked up and just an absolute tornado of fire descended down to the lake shore. While winds wreaked havoc on that wildfire, they helped push flames away from Asuyus. Evacuation orders in the resort town have been reduced, but dozens of firefighters continue to attack the out-of-control fire. Further north, crews working the massive Donny Creek wildfire are mourning one of their own. 25-year-old Zach Muse was killed Friday when his vehicle rolled over an embankment. You talk about a, a person that was honest and hardworking, and, and, and Zach was the definition of that. Muse is the fourth person to die while fighting fires in Canada this season. We're trained to limit the risk factor, but... It's a job that still needs to be done. Like B.C., several other provinces and territories are grappling with wildfires. There are now more than a 1,000 burning across the country. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Coming up after the break. It's all about giving provinces a starting place. From long waits to short staffing, a new diagnosis for Canadian health care. Plus... 
the vintage basketball jersey expected to net millions. Pope Francis is in Portugal for World Youth Day and used the occasion to criticize the clergy there over a long-ignored sexual abuse scandal. The Pope made the comments before meeting with survivors. A report found that nearly 5,000 Portuguese children were sexually abused over seven decades. We now have a clearer picture of the glaring gaps in Canada's health care system. An independent agency has zeroed in on what went wrong during the pandemic, and the results are not surprising. 12% of Canadians didn't have access to family doctors, and surgeries were down 13% as hospitals dealt with staff shortages. CTV's Adrian Gobriel reports. The joy little Roman soy finds in life will warm your heart. What the toddler didn't know is that he's had four scheduled surgeries postponed by Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. He does need this surgery um, basically to save his life. The three-year-old has a birth defect called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which impacts blood flow through the vital organ. His family have been sharing their frustration and desperation with CTV News. His heart, it's so fragile that um, he... Sorry, but you might not be able to wait that long, you know. Stories similar to Romans have prompted the commissioning of a report that is taking the pulse of health care in Canada. It's all about giving provinces a starting place uh, from which to measure their improvement. Each province except Quebec have agreed to share their data with the Canadian Institute for Health Information. Their first report, released today, finds that across the country there was a 13% decrease in surgeries performed in Canada during the pandemic, compared to 2019, and it varied from province to province. The Canadian Medical Association believes the data outlines the vital need for a national health care workforce strategy. We have to push past the numbers. Are there ways that we can use this information to further identify gaps and, and really strategically plan. Roman's bag had been packed to go to the hospital since May. Each appointment cancelled because of a lack of nurses. I think what's going on right now in our healthcare system is, um, is a nightmare. The good news is Roman has finally received his surgery. Tonight he's inside SickKids Hospital recovering. The Canadian Institute for Health Information hope their report paves a way for better access to care for all Canadians. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead, the performer publicly called out over workplace claims that clash with her brand. Pop singer Lizzo, known for being a champion of body positivity on stage, is facing backlash for doing the opposite behind the scenes. The Grammy winner is being accused of creating a hostile work environment that includes weight shaming and sexual harassment. CTV's Heather Butts reports. It's thick, dirty. I've been through a lot, but I'm still flirty. From her hit songs to her Emmy-winning reality show. Girls that look like me don't get representation. Time to pull up my sleeves and find them myself. Lizzo's message has often focused on body positivity. Turn up the music. But now the star herself is being accused of weight shaming in a lawsuit filed by three former dancers. Ariana Davis says Lizzo called attention to her weight gain with thinly veiled concerns, though she never explicitly stated it. I just had this feeling that they had a problem with the way I was gaining weight. Davis filed a lawsuit along with Crystal Williams and Noel Rodriguez. You go from preaching about sisterhood to then turning around and saying that it's a privilege that you know us by name. This pop culture writer says the recent headlines put Lizzo's empowering image under threat. It does feel hypocritical, but I think also just sad and disappointing. I think people feel very personally invested in her journey and her mission, and so there's a real, like, parasocial but real feeling of 
betrayal that happened there. The legal action includes accusations of sexual, religious and racial harassment, discrimination, assault and false imprisonment. It includes allegations some were pressured into touching nude performers at an Amsterdam nightclub. I briefly touched a performer. I was very mortified. Everyone burst into laughter. The trio is also suing Lizzo's production company and her dance captain, Shirlene Quigley. Oscar nominee Sophia Nally Allison, who dropped out of making a Lizzo documentary after only two weeks, supported the dancers on social media, calling Lizzo arrogant, self-centered and unkind. She would pick and choose when she wanted to be professional and when she wanted things to be personal. Lizzo has not publicly responded to the allegations. Heather Botts, CTV News, Toronto. Well, a jersey worn by basketball great Wilt Chamberlain during his 1972 championship win is going to auction and expected to draw $4 million. And the piping on the sides of the sleeve and the top. Wilt still donned the purple and gold when he led the L.A. Lakers to the first of 16 championships. After the break, maritime gold. What shifting sands revealed. We leave you tonight with a curious consequence of climate change. It appears changing ocean currents and intensifying storms are helping to unearth some long-forgotten pieces of Canada's maritime past. CTV Genevieve Beauchemin explains. Sunken secrets have emerged from the depths off the coast of Quebec's Magdalen Islands. A team of divers, history buffs, located seven shipwrecks just since May. These are all wooden shipwrecks and uh, they have some uh, copper sheeting on them and some uh, brass uh, nails and pegs uh, and all of these uh, information tend to tell us that these are from the uh, 1800s. Over centuries, hundreds of ships have sunk in the Gulf of St. Lawrence region, but just over two dozen were pinpointed until now. Five of these newfound treasures are small, likely schooners, but two are much bigger. One of them is at least 130 feet long, uh, so it's really a larger, really larger wreck. And we believe there's a lot of uh, artifacts probably still on board. The divers say they struck gold, so to speak, after many years of combing the seabed. One of their theories is that storms, including last year's devastating Fiona, shifted the sand uncovering the wrecks, making them easier to find. Sunken ships have long fascinated the world. And they're also a key part of this region's history. Some wood that washed ashore was used to build houses. Some rescued passengers became inhabitants. It's a very nice feeling to know that we, we've uncovered something like that and uh, that that shipwreck won't ever be uh, forgotten again. The divers will pass on their findings to discover more about the ships to see whether any cargo or parts should be placed on display in a local museum. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Thank you for sharing your time with us this Wednesday. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. Heather Butts is here tomorrow for Omar and all of us here at CTV National News. Good night. I'll see you Friday. <laughs>